Hey guys, this is John, just posting a recap of the first Chess.com Streamers Challenge, which took place on Wednesday, September 16th. We're a few days removed from the event, so I just thought I'd uh, go through and take you through some key moments from my perspective in this tournament. This tournament was won by John Ludwig Hammer of Norway and Georg Meyer of Germany, two strong grandmasters. And as you can see down here, uh, I was in the mix too, and I played John Ludwig Hammer in the last round in a Scandinavian and very nearly beat him. And if I had done so, I would have tied with Georg Meyer in first place. Uh, but unfortunately, it came up a little bit short. But I had a lot of fun doing this event. At one time, I had uh, 500 viewers on my stream, which was awesome. You guys really turned out and tuned in. So that was fantastic to see. We had a lot of fun on the stream. If you haven't seen the stream, it's on my channel, the full two and a half hours of it. So I just wanted to show you the final standings in the tournament. So here it is. Uh, as you can see, Georg Meyer and John Ludwig Hammer up there with five and a half out of seven. And then four other players at five out of seven, including myself, uh, Maxim Delugi, Alex Lenderman, Blitzstream, Kevin Bordy, who we've previously played on this channel, had a very good showing. And some other prominent YouTubers and streamers uh, finished with four points. And overall, they had a decent number of players. And remember, everybody who played in this event was streaming at the same time. So 25 players, you see poor Simon Williams there down at the bottom. Uh, no, he didn't bomb out in this event. He just had internet troubles. So he was only able to compete in some of the rounds. And I think eventually he just had to give up because his internet kept crashing. Uh, so one thing I wanted to mention is chess.com is running a poll for the fan favorite, uh, the streamer that the viewers like the most. And if you go to the chess.com main page and scroll down on the right, you can see that poll right here, who should win fan favorite for the streamers challenge. And if we click on that, let's just click on the discuss portion of it. We can look at the percentages. So as it stands now through 2,437 votes, I have 18% of the vote. Uh, we've got a lot of other guys. This is in order of most views. So uh, Hutch got the most views. He is a uh, gamer. He's not so much a chess player, but he plays chess and participated in the tournament. Uh, I think he's known for more of games like Call of Duty and such, but He's right up there. Uh, Danny Wrench has garnered a significant portion of the vote. Uh, you got the chess bras, uh, John Ludwig Hammer. But um, yeah, 18% of you have voted for me, which is awesome. I would love to get this percentage higher. Uh, the winner of this poll gets $500, and who doesn't like $500? <laughs> so if you feel that my stream was the best and you'd like to support me, uh, log into chess.com and vote in this poll. I think it closes about three or four days from now, so it's not too late. Maybe we can inch ahead of Danny Wrench up there with 22%. So next thing I want to do, I want to take you guys through some of the key moments in my event in the chess.com streamers challenge. So there were seven rounds and I just went through and looked at the games again and tried to pick out some key moments from each game. So let's start with this one. This is the first round against Cyril 1624. Uh, this is a German player who also watches my videos. So hello to you, Cyril and I'm going to go into training mode just so you guys don't see the moves over here. I don't want to spoil anything. Uh, this was a Nimzo Indian in a line that I felt pretty comfortable with. Knight f3 on move 5. I also play a3 from time to time as well. So Siramur came at me pretty aggressively in this one. Especially with this move queen a5 lining up on the knight on c3. Um, I took on f6 and kind of shattered their kingside structure and then played knight d2, just kind of a defensive move. Black maybe had aspirations of playing knight e4 and trying to pile up on this knight. So knight d2 was just a hedge against that, trying to break the pin on my knight on c3 and reinforce that e4 square. Black played f5. The thing that got Siramur into trouble in this first game was their king safety and their backward development. So there's those two factors. Uh, I think the position actually was pretty reasonable for Black. Right here I played f3. This seemed to me to be a thematic move because black is underdeveloped. This bishop needs to get out, and until that bishop gets out, black cannot connect their rooks. So I wanted to try to open the position now that my king is safe. Uh, I wanted to try to open the position and attack black. You notice that my pawn structure is a little dodgy. I have some pawn weaknesses, so trading down and trying to play for an endgame really isn't an option for me. i got to go for the throat. So after f3, we traded, and my rook joined the attack. Rook f6, e4, f4, rook over. I was feeling pretty confident, and I had a time advantage. 
And by the way, the time control in this event was three minutes with a two second increment. Black played e5, I played g3. So this is a critical moment right here because I think this is where Siramur starts to go wrong. Their position is already a little bit risky, but had they played rook g6, pinning my g, g pawn to my king, uh, they had a fighting chance here because after, say, king h1 getting out of the pin, d6, g takes f4, e takes f4. If I get greedy and grab the pawn on f4, suddenly black's pieces are going to get into the game very quickly. So bishop h3 attacking my rook on f1. And if I try to escape, let's say rook f2, then queen g5, and all of a sudden black is coming down hard on g1 and also g2. This would be uh, terrible for me. So I think Siramur had to place a priority on completing their development and using that uh, as a method to defend their king too. So um, here they actually played after g3, queen c5 check, which helped me because now my king can go to the corner where it feels safer. And now they played queen f8 and simply put, they just do not have time for this. Queen f8 is well-intentioned trying to hold the pawn on f4, but it was much more important to complete development and um, try to counterattack, basically. Uh, Black's king is already compromised, and the only way they're going to survive here is if they get their pieces into play. So after queen f8, I captured on f4. They took with a rook. We traded. I played e5, opening the position. And Siramir made an attempt to get that bishop into the struggle with d6, but now I'm nicely centralized, and... This pawn on f4 is a goner as well. Moreover, they were in terrible time pressure at this point, and I went up a couple pawns, and it was all over very quickly from here. And the final straw was rook f7, winning the bishop. So, Siramur was definitely uh, outrated in this game. I think they put up a good fight. Uh, I'm not sure I would have played the opening this aggressively for black, though. I think, in theory, queen a5 can work, but... Black is taking a lot of liberties with their development. If they're going to embark down this path, they have to take care and uh, really make a point to uh, get that light square bishop into the game. Maybe even b6 somewhere and bishop b7 would have been best. Okay, so I was 1-0 uh, at that point. Let's go to the next game. So in the next game, I had a true test against Maxim Delugi. So this is a uh, grandmaster who lives in the U.S., uh, or I think originally from Russia, but has been in the U.S. for quite a while. Uh, excellent blitz player, even though he doesn't play actively in tournaments anymore. He's an excellent blitz player. And he played the London system. I'm going to skip the opening in this game, because the opening actually turned out all right for me. I accepted a isolated pawn on d5, but I compensated for it with active play. So now I have the so-called hanging pawns after white has traded on c6. These pawns can be strong or weak, depending upon how they're utilized. Uh, for the moment, it remains to be seen uh, what their fate will be. If I can start advancing them, like c5 and maybe d4, I can push white back, but I don't want these pawns to get blockaded. Rook f8, just guarding the bishop. So here, I got c5 in, and this is exactly what you need to do when you have hanging pawns. You need to mobilize them and ensure that they do not become a weakness and they do not become blockaded. If I wait to play the move c5 here, like let's say I play some move like rook a c8, just defending that pawn on c6, white can play b4, kick my queen away, so let's say queen c7, and then a move like knight c5, and white is going to be nicely blockading these pawns, and I'm going to have a hard time of it. So it's crucial that black play actively here. So c5, we traded. White played b3, stabilizing the knight. I played knight e4, jumping in and attacking c3. Queen g4, attacking e6, so I defend that pawn. c4. And this was a key moment, because c4 allowed my queen to infiltrate with queen d2. So I get to swoop in from a5 all the way to d2. And in doing so, I attack these weak pawns. f2 and also a2. And now I felt I was getting excellent play, and I thought I was better. White played rook f1, and I was able to start gathering white's queenside pawns. Queen takes a2. C takes d5, e takes d5. Queen d7 looks dangerous here, but I saw in advance that I had knight f6, which holds both of these points that were under attack, d5 and also e8, and attacks white's queen. Delugi took on a7, and here I push c4. And I was pleased with this last sequence of moves because I'm up a pawn. Also, I'm putting white in a pin along the a file. And in the blink of an eye, 
my C pawn became incredibly dangerous. It was just marching down the board. Here, white attacked my queen with knight c3. I played queen b2, pinning that knight to their queen. And after rook c8, the knight moves away, and suddenly I'm queening and I'm winning material because I've opened up queen takes d2 as a possibility, and white has to respond to the attack, uh, or sorry, the promotion on c1. So they ended up taking with their queen. There's not too many other good options. If rook takes c1, then queen takes d2, and it's going to be similar to the game, perhaps even worse for white because um, in the game I got a queen versus rook position, but white's rook was kind of defensively placed and guarding a lot of stuff around their king, and here this rook is far away from the action. So after I queened, um, honestly I think I relaxed a little bit from this point forward because after uh, queen takes c1, rook takes c1, knight takes c1, in the back of my head I knew that I had to watch out for fortress situations. The battle has been um, confined to one area of the board, the king side now, and having a queen for only a rook plus pawn, I should be winning in a number of ways, um, but I assumed it would be a lot easier than it was. I played knight e4, knight e3, queen d2, and Deluki did the right thing in a practical sense here. He was playing very quickly. He recognized that his position was lost. There's no disputing that. And even though there was that two second increment, he just started firing off moves from here. And I was always down time and I was trying to figure out a way to win. And with my clock constantly ticking, it wasn't easy. I can keep my queen and knight coordinated to attack F2, but he kept finding ways to make life difficult for me. So um, here, h4, I responded with king h7, trying to get my king involved. Delugi played knight h2, just waiting. King to g6, knight back to f3. Now here was a chance to go wrong. If king f5, I would run into knight d4 check, forking <laughs> the king and the queen. That would be terrible. Um, so instead, I played king to f6, which is fine, just avoiding the pin. With these last few moves, I'm just trying to get my king centralized and give myself more options. White is just waiting. Delugi is adopting the approach of just wait and see and ask black how they intend to win. I also made a waiting move, queen c2, knight here. And now I made a, a big mistake by playing knight d2, trading the knights by attacking f1 and also f3. Um, my task as far as winning would be much easier if I kept knights on the board. So one line I looked at in analysis was queen c5, attacking f2 from a different angle. And then say white continues waiting as he was, knight back to h2. Now I can bring my king up. And after knight f3, king g4, White is in Zugzwang, because there is no move here that will not lose something for white. If this knight moves now, king takes h4 will be the answer. The rook cannot move because of queen takes f2 or knight takes f2. And same thing if the king moves. If king h1, there is knight takes f2 winning a pawn. Uh, also, g3 is not possible because we can take that knight on f3. So I needed some plan like this where uh, the king comes up and potentially assists in the attack uh, by hitting h4 and also kind of taking an eye on the f3 knight. I need some plan like that, which in a over the board game with plenty of time, it would not have been difficult to find, but in a blitz game with the clock ticking, it was, it was challenging. And I botched it. I played knight d2, just looking to simplify, but this was the wrong approach because now king and rook and three pawns versus king and queen and two pawns all on the same wing is not a slam dunk for the side with the queen. And as it transpired, Delugi was able to build a fortress. Rook into a7. So the point here is, even though white is abandoning the f2 pawn, like say, queen e1 check, king h2, queen takes f2, this would in fact lose for me after rook f7 with the skewer. That would have been a disaster. So instead, I played queen c1 check, queen f4 check, uh, and repeated the position for a second. Here I should have played queen d4. It turns out this move was still winning. In doing this, I attacked the rook on a7 while defending g7, and also I can try to get my king into g4. Using the king is key in order to win this ending. I gotta get my king in and use that as uh, kind of the missing ingredient to bring down white's position. And if my king gets into g4 and I can force a weakness like g3, I might even be able to stride into f3. Like let's say, uh, just for the sake of argument, something like rook a2, king here, attacking the pawn, g3, 
Uh, now I could potentially bring my king into f3 or h3. I think both squares are pretty strong. Let's say even h3, because uh, now I have threats like queen d5 attacking the rook and also threatening mate on g2. So my king can boldly stride into the heart of white's position and white can't do anything about it. So it was not too late to win this game, but I needed an idea like that. Instead, I played some very lame moves, and I played g6 here, just defending the pawn, check. And Delugi set up an instructive fortress. So g3. Now that white has played g3 and my king is no longer participating, you can see it's cut off along the f-file, this position is a draw. I'm fairly certain about that. I haven't looked at this in depth, but in the game I found nothing, and in analysis I don't see anything either. Because all white has to do is keep their rook on f4, guarding the f2 pawn, which is the only weak point in white's position. Everything else in that pawn chain is stabilized. And because the h4 pawn guards g5 and can always capture my pawn should it advance, I don't have too many ways to win this. The white king is just going to hunker down behind the pawns, and they can either um, move their king back and forth or potentially move the rook if needed, and keep an eye on the f2 pawn. So here Delugi played king g2, I played king e6, king h2. Uh, I could try to sacrifice my queen for the rook at some point, but it's never going to win because I'm going into an ending with white having three pawns versus my two, and even if I win one of the pawns, it's still very likely just going to be drawn. So long story short from here, I just moved around. I was under time pressure this whole time, and we agreed to draw pretty soon. Yeah, I played g5 eventually, not really seeing any other way to proceed, and uh, this was also drawn. Here, Delugi actually let my king cross this uh, f-file equator, but even that didn't help me. My king is not in a position to assist in breaking down this fortress, and the elements of the fortress are still here. The pawn on g3 protecting the rook, pawn on f2 being protected by white's rook, and black being unable to create any meaningful threats. So it was a real shame not to win this game, especially when I felt I had played the first half of it very well and, you know, queened the pawn and got the queen versus the rook. But hey, life goes on. I still had one and a half out of two after this game. So the next game was against the ginger GM, Simon Williams, who had internet troubles throughout this tournament. And I knew Simon was going to do something aggressive because if you've seen his videos, uh, he's very much an attacking player. He prefers complications and wild chess and he has a great sense of chess artistry so he's kind of always looking to create something at the board as opposed to play in clinical or scientific fashion i actually think he um, would have much better results if he reined in that creative instinct i'm sure he has thought about that too but <laughs> you know you have to play chess for the reasons that appeal to you and i think he decided a while ago that he wants to play chess in his own style, and he's not necessarily concerned about what is correct chess, which is admirable, and I think that's what makes chess interesting, the fact that you can utilize so many styles, and he's a grandmaster, so I'm not going to second guess much of what he does. Um, here, though, I will second guess this move that he made. He castled queenside in this position, which is pretty risky if I do say so. I think white should have settled for something like uh, maybe just e3 in this position. And we have kind of a Cambridge Spring style position where black has developed the bishop to b4, pinning the knight on c3. Maybe I'll play queen a5 and knight e4 if I get a chance. Whoa, that is not the way the knight moves, knight e4. Uh, but I was actually looking for a more calm game, and I was hoping we'd like castle on the same side of the board, and I could try to outplay him somehow. But uh, the ginger GM, true to his style, he castles queenside and immediately adopts a, a bring it on attitude. So I played queen a5. White's king is pretty drafty. I mean, they've already moved their c-pawn up the board. With queen a5, I'm threatening to capture on c3 and maybe get at the a2 pawn. Bishop d2 was played. I took. Now Simon took with the bishop. If they took with the pawn, this would allow white's queen to defend a2, but I can take on c4, so I'm still winning a pawn. So after bishop takes c3, I took on a2 and... Uh, was up a pawn. White played e3. I jumped into e4. Bishop back to e1. Here, I'm actually threatening queen a1 check, queen b1, queen takes b1, king takes b1, knight takes f2 with the fork on the two rooks. And I think at the time when I was live streaming, I didn't see a defense actually to that for white, but Simon quickly came up with bishop e1, which 
uh, defends f2, over protects that square, which is a nice tidy defense. And I'm still up a pawn, but uh, Simon managed to avoid the big problems in the position. We traded. I think I might have misplayed this portion of the game a little bit. Here I tried to get my bishop into the game, c5. I want to free my light square bishop. And here Simon came up with an excellent idea. He played after bishop b5, knight f6, move f3. So trying to block the scope of my light square bishop. We've talked about it in videos before how if you're trying to shut down a bishop, it's a really good idea to put two connected pawns on the same diagonal as that bishop. That's what he's doing here. I took on d4. And then instead of recapturing, white plays another excellent move, e4. Ignoring the pawn, but creating like a super chain where this bishop is now completely out of the game. And also my knight on f6 is restricted. So these pieces are not too happy. Now he came into c7 and attacked my bishop. And over the next few moves, I was very much on the defensive. And despite being up two pawns, I was not uh, totally happy about having given Simon the initiative like this, because I know he's very dangerous when that happens. Uh, here I did get in knight f4. I'm not really sure white should have played e5. I think that's probably a mistake. But after knight f4, rook d1, I played a6, backing off white's light square bishop. I just wanted these bishops out of my face a little bit. Bishop f1. And now I play knight d5, a good backwards move, attacking the rook, and also maybe looking to play knight e3 with a fork on the rook and the bishop. And the position is better for black, but here Simon gave away the game. Uh, so unfortunately for him, he played rook takes d4, which loses after knight takes c7. Uh, I don't know if he just missed the fact that his rook was hanging, or um, he thought this was a decent chance. I'm guessing he just missed it, because uh, I don't think many people would look at this position and willingly go into this for white. But after knight takes c7, the game is all but over. He recaptured. I took on d4, he took my rook. Now I'm up in exchange plus a pawn and my rook is active as well. And I kind of just cleaned up from here and quickly won the game. So this game was mostly decided by that blunder of his on move 28, rook takes d4. Uh, White's opening I think was maybe somewhat to blame. This, this dug him a hole and he was down a pawn. Although it has to be said that he uh, managed to create some nice compensation, especially utilizing that idea of blocking my light square bishop, building this chain of light square pawns. So with that victory, I moved to two and a half out of three. Up next, I played one of the chess bras, uh, Robin van Kampen from the Netherlands. So he was playing for the chess bras team. And uh, I believe he was playing from, uh, yeah, the Netherlands. The chess bras are mainly located in Canada. Let's take a look at this. I'll hide the notation. This one was a King's Indian. I played the same-ish variation, which is f3. And I played a line that's kind of a pet line of mine, which is 6, knight g, e2. I won't get into too many opening details. And I predicted the line that von Kampen would play, actually. So right here, uh, I made a comment that I wouldn't be surprised if he played queen e8, which is a trendy move. This move looks kind of ridiculous. Um, but in playing queen e8, black escapes the pin on the diagonal, uh, the pin on the knight on f6. And often this queen can make an appearance on e5. So this has been tried in some GM games recently, and I've actually faced it over the board myself recently uh, against uh, Georgi Margvalashvili in a game that I lost. So von Kampen being very up on theory and being a, a strong grandmaster, no doubt he was prepared in this line. Nevertheless, the position turned out pretty well for me. I swapped the dark square bishops, retreated the knight to f1. Black got very aggressive on the king side, which I think is largely okay. Although after f4 and knight c4 and rook f6, I found a good way to uh, open the position. And that was the move g3. So I felt like with my uh, king being uncommitted yet, whereas black's king has already castled kingside, uh, these pawns being thrust down the board, the f and h pawns, uh, has a potential drawback in that I can strike at them and look to open lines. So this is maybe the, the price that black is playing for their earlier activity. So now after g3, uh, von Kampen tried his best to keep the position closed, queen f8. I took f4, rook takes f4. Now from this point forward, I do not think I played very well. And I got outplayed and I lost. Um, I played rook g1, this move is fine. Rook b8, a5, just looking to uh, put a stop to b5 potentially. 
If b5 is played, I'm going to take on passant. And then after maybe uh, knight takes b6, I can play knight a5 and potentially get into c6. So instead, von Kampen played queen f6. And round about here, I started consuming a lot of time. I think I had a nice time advantage. I was maybe up a minute, maybe a minute and a half. Um, not probably closer to a minute. And I was racking my brain trying to find a plan because I knew that I wanted to attack Black's king. I've got this nice rook down the g-file, but Black has kind of a blockade on the dark squares. Neither of us has a dark square bishop, but Black has built some pretty strong resistance along the dark squares, like these points, basically. So I castled here, but my position kind of fizzled out after that. I think I should have played knight e3, which would have been a good move to threaten this knight f5 check. Uh, knight f5 check is a nice interference move because then black's queen would no longer be protecting the rook on f4 and I could play queen takes f4 and this rook doesn't have anywhere to run notice that f3 is covered by my bishop so this would have been the way forward and um, had I played this move I think I would have had good chances um, for instance if knight e5 I can get this check in and if black takes with the bishop I have queen takes f4 and I've won the exchange uh, or if rook takes f5, pawn takes f5, bishop takes f5, which is better. Black does have a minor piece plus a pawn for the exchange, but still, I think white should be doing excellently. So after uh, I castled queenside, though, I didn't have much of an advantage. Uh, Black played knight e5 because it's just hard to break through on the dark squares, and also the, the pressure that I have on g6 is coming to naught, basically. Um, I'm unable to double my rooks up on the file. If I were to play like rook g2 or something here, I think black can always play bishop h3 and kick this rook away. You can see that there's not much space up the file to go to, so I'd probably have to go to f2 or come back to g1, and it would be kind of a waste. And I really just floundered from here. I played knight a4, von Kampen played knight g5, rook over. This was a mistake. In trying to defend my f-pawn, I allow more black pieces to come into the fray, and he took on f3. We traded queens. We were getting close to a time scramble roundabout here, but black just proved to have the better of it down the stretch. And now he went after my H pawn. And even though I have a passed D pawn myself, black's bishop controls the D pawn's advance. So the D7 square is always monitored. And von Kampen's king side pawns were much too dangerous, whereas my D pawn was stalled and weak. And yeah, I even lost that pawn. Try to create a passed A pawn, but with black having both H and G pawns rumbling down the board, it does not matter at this point. These two pawns are far stronger than my lone A pawn, which cannot even be promoted anyways. I tried some last ditch efforts. Knight B7, maybe looking to sneak in knight to D8, interfering with the rook's defensive A8, but bishop E4 was a strong response because this bishop attacks the rook, and also it will be controlling the queening square should this knight move. And here I resigned. So, unfortunate to lose this game after such a hot start of 2.5 out of 3. This uh, put me down to 2.5 out of 4. Uh, I think von Kampen played well in the middle game and really took control of the position around about move 23 when I castled queenside. Had I found something a bit better like that uh, knight e3 move in this position, I think I had good chances to uh, win this game. Okay, so moving to the next round. The next round I played a uh, Russian streamer, Shamat Kanal. I don't know much about this player. They seem to be fairly strong. Um, they were streaming entirely in Russian. I think the only Russian language streamer uh, in the tournament. I would estimate that they're probably FM strength, maybe. Hard to say. Uh, they were listed as untitled on chess.com, but you can see there, this is the chess.com blitz rating, 2337, not bad at all. So this was an exchange, Queen's Gambit declined. The first part of the game proceeded fairly normally. Uh, now, I had been going over a game with a student recently where he had actually reached almost this identical position from the white side, and that student played the move b4 with no preparation. Usually when you're preparing a minority attack in these positions, you have to play rook a, b1, and then b4. But white can get away with playing b4 here, even though black can reply with queen takes b4, because white has uh, three pieces attacking the knight on e4. So after Shamat Kanal took on b4 with the queen, I took on e4, 
and I've equalized the material balance. And I feel white slightly better here because I have two center pawns to my opponent's none. Uh, also, the B files, the B file and the C file are open, and my rooks will be excellently positioned on B1 and C1 potentially. So I think it's safe to say white has an, an edge in this position. We both made some normal moves. Rook b8 is useful for black to defend b7. I was just trying to get both my rooks participating. Uh, interestingly, I'm not really going to use my central majority yet. I don't see a need to advance the e and the d pawns. Uh, maybe I could arrange e4 someday, but for now that would just present black with more targets. I was mainly focused on seeing how I could exploit these three pawns. I, I wanted to crank up the pressure on black's majority over here and try to use the value of my open b and c files. And pretty soon I was afforded with a nice opportunity. Here I played queen c5, offering a queen trade and also attacking a7. I think maybe Shamat Kanal should have traded queens here, but they decided to keep queens on the board with queen e6. Uh, as it turns out, I actually could have taken on a7 here. And I didn't play this move because... Oh wait, I'm sorry, is this the moment where I could have taken on a a7? Maybe not. I think it was here. Yes, this is the moment where I could have taken on a7. So after inserting bishop c4, queen e4. Um, in the game, I played my knight back to c3, attacking black's queen on c4. But I could have actually played queen takes a7 here. During the game, I rejected that because of rook a8. And I thought, oh, you know, my queen's going to have to move, and then black gets to play rook takes a4. But if you want to pause your video and figure out why is, is white doing well after queen, uh, rook to a8, in fact... Uh, what can I play here? What's my follow-up? Okay, so had this happened, I actually could have played queen takes b7, rook takes a4, and now queen takes f7 check. I did not uh, calculate this line whatsoever. I just stopped calculating after uh, rook a8 and assumed that this was bad. But had I gone a little further, I would have seen queen takes b7, rook takes a4, queen takes f7. And now my bishop on c4 proves its worth. Uh, black has to play king h8, and then I'm going to take on f6, and this is going to be a swift mate, especially since my rook gets to uh, come to b7 and join in on the assault on black's king. So it was possible to do that. Hard to see in a blitz game, though. So after queen e4, I just returned my knight to c3. And actually, this turned out well, too, because black has to move their queen, and now I took on a7. With the difference being that if rook a8, uh, I can take on b7 with confidence, there are no complications. There's no knight on the A file that is hanging. And my rook on B1 defends the queen. So after queen takes A7, uh, Shamat Kanal tried to gain some counterplay. They played bishop F5, attacking my rook. I played rook B2, and then knight to G4. Um, sort of a vague attacking move. I mean, it does apply pressure to uh, these pawns here. And maybe queen to H4 is a potential threat. But... Being so solid with this structure, I haven't really made any huge weaknesses. I feel white should be able to survive the brunt of black's attack. So I played queen c5, just returning my queen and looking for a queen trade. Shamat Kanal played queen h4, attacking h2. And I played queen d6, where the queen defends this pawn and also eyes the rook on b8 as well. Now here, Shamat Kanal kind of swung for the fences with knight takes e3, but after takes, rook takes... I'm just gathering material. Queen takes b8. Black took here. There are some threats I have to be concerned about as far as discoveries on my king, but they really don't come to much. Uh, Black probably should have captured my bishop on c4 right now. Yeah, because as played, I was just up a rook when uh, the complications were over and swiftly went on to win. So I thought this was a well-played game. I'm not unhappy about any decision I made here. Uh, the only thing that might have been nice would have been to appreciate the fact that queen takes a7 could have been played on move 23. Uh, but other than that, I think I played well in this game. So after this one, I had three and a half out of uh, five. And in the next game, I played Greg Shahadi. So Greg Shahadi is another YouTuber. He has uh, hundreds of videos on his channel. And I know him fairly well in real life, too. So um, he's always a tough blitz player. Actually, the very first video I posted on YouTube was an over-the-board game of Greg and I playing at uh, the Mechanics Chess Club in San Francisco, California. So Greg was having an awesome event up to this point. I believe he had four out of five and was tied for first. 
there was a number of players on that score. Uh, so, of course, I had to trot out the Scandinavian, and in particular the Queen D8 line, which I've been uh, gushing about lately. <laughs> I've been professing my love for this variation all over my channel. And this game turned out to be rather instructive because Greg didn't get much out of the opening. He chose a sort of a, a quieter line where he fianchettos the light score bishop. But he really didn't get a whole lot. Uh, here we, cha we traded knights on d5, and I opted to take with the c-pawn, kind of unbalancing the position. I could take with the e-pawn, but then we have a fairly symmetrical structure. And I really wanted to win at this point. I mean, as far as prizes and doing well in the tournament goes, uh, nothing but a win would make me happy in this situation. So I took with a c-pawn looking to unbalance. There were some further trades. We swap dark square bishops. Now here, interestingly enough, this is a structure that I most commonly get from the white side in exactly the opening you saw in the last game against Shamat Kanal. And that's the Queen's Gambit declined uh, Carlsbad structure. And because white has this majority of pawns over here, but black has the half open C file to work with, this is a green light for me to introduce the minority attack, which is using less pawns to attack more. So hence I played b5, and the plan here is to continue with a5 and eventually b4, looking to break up white structure. Because otherwise this pawn structure is difficult to get at. It's too solid, it has a base on b2. Black needs to use these pawns aggressively, use our minority aggressively, and try to like use it as a battering ram, really, to make a weakness in white structure. Which will happen when we make contact with their pawns uh, from b4, attacking c3 and a3. So this plan worked out pretty well. We traded a bit more. I brought my other rook over to the C file. And I was feeling good at this point because I'd been in these situations many times before. And um, objectively speaking, this is probably fine for white, but black holds all the chances. Um, black has this plan of pushing B4 and it's difficult to suggest anything for white in return. White just kind of has to sit around and wait. White could potentially play b4, like say on the last move. They could think about playing b4 in a bid to stop me from playing b4. But then this pawn on c3 is a target. It's a backward pawn, and it's as good as useless. I mean, it can never advance to c4. Um, sometimes white can hope to hold out this way, but a, a plan for me would be to, let's say, play a4, sink one of my rooks into c4, which is an excellent outpost, and maybe even triple up on the c-file, maybe put the other rook on c6 and the queen behind it on c7. Uh, white can try to defend c3 with everything they've got, but then I might start moving my other pawns up the board and create other opportunities. Still though, b4 was something white could consider here. As it happened, Greg allowed me to push b4. Maybe I didn't have to play that move so quickly. I could have played potentially rook c4 and waited, but I wanted to make sure I got the, the b4 pawn advance in to weaken their position. There's a capture, rook a6 hitting my queen. I drop back to c7. Here I provoked further simplifications, queen c4. I thought this would be a good way to get my rook into c4. And pretty soon we're going to have a characteristic situation where uh, black has one uninterrupted pawn island. So this pawn chain stretching from h7 all the way to d5, because we're going to assume that the b pawn is going to get traded on c3. And White will have two distinct pawn islands, the h4 to f2 chain and then a d4 c3 chain. And with black having one less pawn island, that's uh, less black has to worry about, whereas white has to manage two pawn islands and c3 is backward and weak. So black is comfortably better here. It's a position a good player might be able to hold as white, but um, a good player will also be pushing this pretty hard as black too. Here Greg retreated their rook to a1. A line I was speculating on during the game was b3. Rook takes c3, rook takes c3, b takes c3, and now the move rook c6. I thought this might be an interesting way for white to trade off a pair of rooks and try to dissipate the pressure. And because of the back rank weakness that I have, I cannot play rook takes b3. This would be just losing the game after rook c8 checkmate. So I was wondering if that might be an option for Greg. Uh, and looking at the game with Stockfish later, it suggests the move g5, which is an excellent move to uh, free up my king, so it creates luft creates a space for my king to advance. And in the event that white takes the pawn on g5, I could take on b3 and I'd be defending this advanced c pawn. 
I think black is much better here. Um, not sure if black is winning, but black has chances. Or alternative, alternatively, after g5, if white were to play rook takes c3, then I could take h4, sink the rook into b4, and once again, I think it's a tale of uh, pawn structure and also rook activity. I have two pawn islands now. The h pawn is kind of weak. White has three pawn islands, though. Or sorry, actually four pawn islands, because all of these are isolated and potential targets. Uh, and I have the more aggressively placed rook. My rook is in an attacking role, looking at the d4 and the b3 pawns, whereas right, white's rook has to stay on d3 for the moment, monitoring both of those pawns. Even with this, I'm not sure black can win, but it's such an easy position to play, I would have been happy to go for something like this. I'd probably start bringing my king up. But as played, Greg did not choose to play b3 on move number 29, so he played the rook back to a1. I played h5, just creating Luft. This is a type of move you'll see often. Uh, we're in an endgame, but I can't really do much on the queen side. Like, I cannot play take, take, and rook b3, because again, this back rank weakness comes back to bite me. And, and I can just resign after this, getting back rank checkmated. So h5 is just a move to gain space with my pawns and free up a route for the king. And going forward a little bit, we both brought our kings into the action. I ended up taking on c3, looking to create that weakness on that square. But Greg defended nicely. I think this is the proper position for his king. It's centralized and it's helping his rook to defend. Otherwise, he would have to assign both rooks to the defense of c3, which isn't too appetizing. King f5, he came down and attacked my pawn on f7. I defended. I wanted to rule out rook a7 once again, so I played my rook back to c7. f3, king f5. And I made progress by pushing my e pawn. I can't really increase the pressure on c3, but what I can do is try to knock out their d4 pawn, which did happen. And after this occurs, I am now threatening d4, pinning that pawn on c3. So Greg moved the king back. I played the rook into c4, and then got d4 in on the next move. So now c3 is under attack three times. Uh, maybe white could consider something very passive like rook c1, but playing passively in a rook ending is usually the kiss of death. That's precisely what you want to avoid under most circumstances. So it's understandable that Greg took on d4 now. And here, I made a mistake because I took on c2 and then took on f3, but I believe it should end in a draw after this. It would have been stronger to play rook takes d4 check. And after king e2, I mean, in the game, I didn't see much for black from this position, but I could have played rook dd3 had this position arose. And then I have two rooks on the third rank attacking that pawn on f3. And should white defend it with a move like rook f1, here I can give a check, and I'm just straight up going to win the f3 pawn. So on the premise of that variation, I definitely should have taken on d4 with the rook, but I was fixated on trading rooks and taking here, and I knew I was simplifying the position, but I was hoping that my king being closer to the action over here on the king side, whereas white's king is a bit further away, not participating, I was hoping this might give me the edge in the ending and potentially even allow me to win. I think there's a couple ways that white could play here. I believe rook a5 actually would have been the strongest, pinning that pawn on e5. And then after rook takes g3, rook takes e5, it's kind of dangerous for black to try king g4 because white's d-pawn could start running. But instead of rook a5, Greg took on e5. Now I want to avoid king takes e5 because of rook a5 check, and white is going to swing over and win my h5 pawn. So I played after d takes e5, rook takes g3. Greg correctly got behind the e-pawn, threatening to push it. I blocked with my king. He played rook e4, using the rook uh, vertically to defend e5 and also laterally to defend h4. And now after rook g4, we reached a critical position. And if you want, you can pause your video and ask yourself, what should white do here? White to move, what should white play? The answer is king to d3. This would have been best for white, and I commented on that during the game. Um, this defends white's rook, and it makes sure that this rook doesn't have to move. And if that rook doesn't have to move, I cannot win the h4 pawn with my rook. 
Uh, now, trading down is definitely not going to be good for black. Um, I wonder if this is even losing. Maybe not, but I would not want to trade rooks because now my g-pawn is backward. It can't go up to g5 because of white's pawn here. And um, I have no winning chances and I'd be lucky to get a draw from here. So I don't really know what black should do. I guess I would try to move my rook away or something, but as long as the king stays close to the white rook, black has no winning chances. And surely the game would have ended at a draw after this. So he could have done that, but instead he took on g4 and I was really surprised he did this, first of all, because it's a losing move, but he also played it pretty fast too. I think he had enough time that he could have, um, if I'm remembering correctly, I don't think he had to just dash out a move here. I thought he had sufficient time to take a moment and think about it. But after rook takes g4, h takes g4, uh, now I'm going to win the e5 pawn. And even though I have double g pawns, this pawn on h4 is a goner. I can play king over to f5 soon or up to f4 as played. And after g3, I'm just going to go and collect the h pawn. If I didn't have g6, this would be a draw because white's king is an ideal spot to hold it. But after king h3, king h1, check here. Um, you can imagine if there was no g6 pawn, I'd have to lose the pawn or give stalemate with king g3. But here I can instead advance g5, and I get to squeeze white's king out, king f2, king h2, and I'm promoting and winning. So Greg resigned at that point. So a tragic ending uh, for Greg because he did fight back and defend the ending pretty nicely. And uh, after king d3, I think he would have been rewarded with a draw. But that's what happens. You know, these games are filled with tension and people are prone to making mistakes, even in relatively simplified positions. And after this, he was in a losing ending. I did feel pretty good about this game, though, overall. I think I pushed nicely and uh, Greg was doing well in the tournament and he's uh, uh, a pretty good blitz player. So I was happy to get in a position where I could try to grind him down. Okay, so now we go on to the decisive final round against Mr. John Ludwig Hammer, Sultan of Kings. So in this final round, I was trailing the leaders by a half point, so I had to, I had to win this. Um, I had done nicely in the past couple games against Shamat Kanal and Greg to get into a position to uh, potentially tie for first, but or even win outright if the stars aligned. But um, I knew as black against John Ludwig Hammer, uh, who is Magnus Carlsen second and a prominent grandmaster from Norway, I knew it wasn't going to be easy. So as luck would have it, I got another Queen D8 Scandinavian. What more could you ask for? <laughs> and I played this line with A6 followed by B5. Um, unbalancing the position a little bit compared to what we're used to in the Scandinavian. And the plan is to put Black's light square bishop on the long diagonal. So bearing down on White's king. And I was happy with the result of the opening. I actually went back and watched uh, John Ludwig's stream out of curiosity, and he was he was kind of negative about, about Black's position, but honestly, I think he kind of misassesses this position. I think this is fine for Black. Uh, you know, I'm certainly not going to second-guess many 2600 Grandmasters, but I do have some experience in the Scandinavian, and I, I think Black's position is fine. Uh, actually, if we look at the engine, it was very much approving of uh, the setup that I had. Uh, sometimes a5 is kind of annoying because it allows white to utilize this square and these pawns are kind of cut off from each other. But overall, I think black's position is sound enough to make up for it. c4 is also a bit weakened, but remember I have this strong light square bishop. Um, my knight can come to c5 potentially. a5 could be weak down the road. Overall, I think this is completely acceptable for black. So I castled. And here I reposition my bishop. Uh, in his stream, Ludwig was, uh, Hammer was kind of commenting that maybe he thought I was going for e5, but e5 was never really entering my thought process here. I was just trying to put my bishop on a better diagonal, and I like the idea of having both bishops bearing down on white's king, so that's why I played that move. Rook e1, I played rook e8, knight b3. I played c5, just looking to put the queen on c7, creating a queen-bishop battery. And here is where uh, John Ludwig blundered. He played bishop to h4. Uh, probably should have played a move like knight bd2. I think this would have been stronger, reinforcing the knight on f3. And after bishop h4, if you want to pause your video, you can do so. Um, how should black play? Okay, so the answer is bishop takes f3. 
trading the strong light square bishop for the knight. Normally, this would not make much sense. I mean, if we were just trading simply to trade, this would be a terrible decision. But after queen takes f3, I can take the pawn on h2. Bishop takes h2. There's no longer a knight on f3 defending that pawn. Uh, now, this was the funniest uh, slash <laughs> most tragic moment of uh, the stream for me, potentially, aside from the ending of this game. Because after bishop takes f3, queen takes f3, I completely forgot to play the move bishop takes h2 check. I was so wrapped up in my calculations, and I was definitely feeling um, the tension of the situation that I played knight e5, which is a move I had considered here, but I had discarded it in favor of bishop takes h2. I was fully ready to play this move. And <laughs> as soon as he recaptured, I was like, oh, knight e5. But then a split second later, I realized, oh, I actually meant to take that pawn on h2. Duh. <laughs> so that happens sometimes in chess. Like occasionally you'll, you'll get your wires crossed and your, your hand or your mouse will play a move that uh, your brain never intended to play. <laughs> so it's just a part of being a chess player. It happens on occasion. But had I played bishop takes h2, I don't think this is uh, fatal for white, but it is a, a pretty much a clear pawn for black. Black is significantly better. But as it turned out, I played knight e5, forking the queen and the bishop. Hammer fled with the queen to h3. Now the queen is assisting and defending h2, so that's fine. I played my, my knight back to d7. I just didn't want to give white an opportunity to play bishop takes f6. I think the position is roughly equal from here, so... Despite miss missing bishop takes h2, it's not uh, a big deal. The game goes on. I maneuvered my knight over to g6, attacking the bishop, so John Ludwig retreated to g3. We got some trades in on c6 and also on g3. Here I thought h takes g3 was a little dubious for him. I think queen takes would have been more natural, because after h takes, I think white's queen is in danger of being out of play on h3. Um, I think it's kind of a pipe dream that he's going to mate me on the h-file. There's a lot of factors that would have to go against black for that to happen. So I think he should have taken with the queen and kept his structure better together. Uh, here I had a nice pawn break with b3, which would have enabled me to destabilize the c2, d3 chain. Uh, and if takes, I get to play rook takes d3 with advantage. Uh, but I didn't play that move. I played knight e7, trying to reposition my knight. I had my sights set on the juicy d4 square. I thought this would be an excellent outpost, attacking c2 and uh, potentially even knight e2 check, especially if white were to come over with that rook to defend. And of the two knights, like both his knight and my knight have good outposts, but I think my knight's a bit more aggressively placed. c4 is pretty nice for white, but uh, d4 is actually hitting that pawn on c2, and white's always going to have to tend to that pawn with a piece. So rook c1. I was somewhat behind on time here, so I had to start making moves more quickly. Rook d5, queen h4. Here I played h6. So queen h4 makes way for the rook to come over to h3, but I, as I said, I really think white was playing optimistically and um, trying to maybe confuse me with this h-file plan that really should not work for him. Um, h6, knight into b6. This move I don't think is so good. It actually kind of encourages me to make a move that I wanted to play. Rook g5, and now f4. And here was a nice moment for me. Um, if you want to pause your video and try to figure out what black should do, you can do that. So black to move and win a pawn. So the move is knight f5. This is a nice move, and I know I drew a lot of arrows there. Uh, but the point of knight f5 is that even though I'm putting two pieces on pre, he cannot take either one. Uh, the knight on f5 is attacking white's queen on h4, so white does not have time to take the rook on g5. And if instead g takes f5 is played, capturing the knight, well, I would win the tournament or tie for first <laughs> with queen takes g2 checkmate. Meanwhile, uh, knight f5 is a nice fork on the queen and the rook. So John Ludwig had to retreat queen h3. And here I get to play rook takes g4, deflecting white's queen, White takes, and now I can take the rook, and I've won a pawn from that transaction. So I was feeling pretty confident here. I mean, what more can you ask for? I was black in the final round, a half point behind the leader, very strong player, and now I'm in a position to potentially win. Uh, the clock was a very big factor at this point, though. I think I played well over these next series of moves. Got my knight back to d4. 
Here I made a decision to try to force the play with g5, breaking up that pawn. Uh, if white takes on g5, I can potentially just trade queens. And after king takes f2, take back. This is actually what happened in the game. And white has to go and defend the c2 pawn once again. So knight to e3. Here I brought my king up. Hammer played rook c1. I played f5. Knight c4, king f6. So I'm up a pawn. I'm just trying to play this slowly and utilize my g, f, and e pawns. Start advancing them up the board. White has to do something. Uh, knight d2, I thought maybe white was trying to play knight f3 and trade off my good knight. So I played g4, stopping that plan. And now Hammer played c3. So this is a good idea because if white doesn't do something like this, black is gradually going to win the game. Um, I think I responded a little incorrectly to c3. I probably should play knight b5, moving the knight back and attacking c3 and opening up rook takes d3. And after, say, b takes, rook takes d3, hitting the knight, king e2, rook c3, I think black should win because now uh, white doesn't have time to take on c5 because the rook is hanging. And after, say, rook takes c3, knight takes c3, check, king up, take here. I'm up two pawns, and this would have been much easier than the game. So that was a missed opportunity, not saying knight b5. Instead, I dropped the knight back to c6, hoping for c takes b4, knight takes b4, after which knight takes d3 is inevitable. And white, again, does not have time to take here because they get forked, their king and their rook. But here's where, where Hammer really shows his class, and I've often found against GMs that it's just really hard to uh, put the nail in the coffin against them. It's hard to put them away they just find so many resources to resist. They don't go down easily. Um, it's a good lesson for everyone. GMs resist till the final, till the final blow, basically. Um, so white played king e2. He kind of senses that he should not allow my knight into b4. And here I took the pawn on a5. And I was thinking, life is good. I'm up two pawns. Uh, but the problem is my knight gets a little sidelined over here. And now he starts gaining some play, rook c7. And I think he even made a comment on his stream that it's not so easy for black now because my knight has a hard time rejoining the action. There's no square it can go to, as you can see. Everything's covered by white's pieces. So I played rook d5. White played king e3. And time again was a very big factor. Um, we're getting close to a position where uh, I'm just going to have to make moves and hope for the best and not really be able to calculate. So I employed like a little time gaining strategy. I tried to repeat the position once. And then I played e5. Hammer played g3, stopping f4 check. And here, I think I blew my chances of winning by playing f4 check. In hindsight, I should just wait here with something like rook d6. Maybe someday I can get this knight back into the game. It's no longer easy. Uh, I believe the engine, you can load it, but it was showing roughly a two pawn advantage for black. So consistent with the two pawns that I'm up, but it's no longer simple. And that ticking time that uh, the great equalizer, the clock, that's playing an ever growing role as we dash out these final moves. Uh, whenever you're in time pressure, like the tendency is always to try to force the play. And I saw F F4 check was going to lead to some simplifications, but I was hoping that um, I could still pull it out as we trade off more stuff here. So rook takes d3, I'm hitting the white knight. I'm still up two pawns, but after knight e4 check, my king moves. Rook here, uh, my remaining pawns are very weak. a6 is hard to defend, if not impossible, so is g4. Um, White's b3 pawn is going to be lost most likely, but since I'm going to lose the a and the g pawns, I'm pinning my hopes on the b pawn, and you can see my king is far afield. It's, it's never gonna be able to help out. So the position now is, is drawn. Hammer got behind the B pawn. Here I set a little trap. Um, actually, I think it was on the previous move. I was hoping that white would play king takes g4 instead of rook b6, whereupon I could play this and say, um, say white plays like king f3. Now I have this trick, rook takes e4. And if king takes e4, I have knight c5 check, forking uh, the king and the rook. And my knight will be able to defend my remaining pawn and I can bring my king up and win. But Hammer completely avoided that trick. Oh yeah, and note that uh, after rook takes e4, if white were to play rook here check, I do have rook e7 and black is winning once again. But the wily John Ludovic Hammer, he noticed that trick and just played rook b6, repositioning his rook and getting behind the pawn. 
I played rook d4, king e5, and my time was just ticking away. I think I was well under 10 seconds here, just kind of living off that two second increment. I played g3, and I knew at this point my chances of winning the tournament were gone. Uh, and actually, I had a scare because after knight h6 check, I thought I was losing for a second. I thought I had blown the entire game. White is forking my king and my rook. But um, a split second later, I came to my senses and realized that after king e7, knight takes g4, I do have the saving move knight d7. So I managed to avoid losing the full point. That would have been extra tragic having been up two pawns. But with me only having the b pawn remaining... White can easily eliminate that. They can even offer their knight for it, and the game was drawn. I have insufficient mating material. So um, an interesting game, um, a game that featured mutual mistakes throughout. Um, for my part, I just did not play bishop takes h2 on move 18, just a complete lapse of concentration there. I'm going to blame it on the, the tension of the moment. Uh, I think Hammer played pretty speculatively at at portions as well, but this was the last round. Um, it's a tough tournament. You know, you're getting pretty difficult games most every round. And um, what can I say? I, I tried to win. I put minus myself in a position to do it and just came up a little bit short. But nonetheless, I was pleased with my finish in the tournament with five and a half out of seven. And I think I won a little money too, maybe $125. Uh, so nothing to sneeze at. So that was my tournament from start to finish, those seven rounds. Uh, hope that was interesting for you guys. And once again, if you liked my stream and want to help me out and vote in the chess.com fan favorite poll, please go to chess.com and do that. You just need a chess.com account. That's it. You can go on and it takes two seconds to vote. And thank you guys for watching. Really appreciate it. And I'll be streaming more in the future. So stay tuned for that. All right, guys. Bye.